Hi, and welcome to the Geopolitical Futures Podcast. I'm Xander Snyder, and we have a treat for you today. Joining me is our co-founder, George Friedman, and we're going to answer some of your questions with the hashtag AskGPF that was sent to us on Twitter. So the very first one is going to be on North Korea. George, this is coming from Aaron, and his question is, the DPRK has not tested a missile in a few weeks, should we thank China or is there something else going on? Well, hi, everybody, and I'm delighted to be here. It doesn't feel so special, but I don't think China has very much to do with this. Uh, I think the negotiations that are going on between the United States and the Koreans, and more to the point, uh, the gathering of U.S. forces, uh, aircraft carriers, F 35s today to uh, Japan, these things are calling attention to the Koreans that the United States is actually likely to take military action. Now, whether the United States is or not is known only to the president and hopefully a very few uh, advisors. But what we're signaling to him is that as we come up to President Trump's visit to uh, Asia, and as we come up to uh, the point at which we feel that the North Koreans may be close to having a deliverable system, war is really is an option. And I think somewhere in the past few weeks, it's occurred to the North Koreans that the, the idea that they were getting was that the South Koreans were blocking the Americans from attacking. The South Koreans were so frightened of North Korean artillery that that may not hold back the United States. And I think, you know, there was first the assumption the U.S. could attack at will. The second was there was going to be tremendous casualties if it was taken. And now for it's been transmitted to the Chinese, we may go anyway, either because we have a solution to that problem or because we're just, the South Koreans are finally prepared to absorb it. So I don't think the Chinese had a lot to do with this. I think it has to do with the fact that the North Koreans really are facing the abyss, or think they are, and the U.S. is doing everything they can to make them feel that way. Great. So now we're going to hop to the complete opposite side of the world. This is a question from Rick and has to do with the Middle East. Why, why, George, does everyone in the Middle East seem to hate the Kurds with such undying passion, he writes? Well, first, we're not on the other side of the world. We're kind of far away, but not the other side. Um, and second, they don't, I don't think most people hate them. Most people know them. The, the real fact is that they were excluded from nationhood after World War I. They are integral parts of three countries, Tur four actually if you count Syria, Turkey, Iran, and Iraq. And each of these countries are afraid that if a united Kurdistan were formed, it would threaten uh, their their interests. It would threaten their uh, security. So they may hate them or not hate them, but this is you know pretty cold blooded calculation on their part. And as for the rest of the world, what you can say is that there's a great deal of indifference about the Kurds. No one cares about them. But I don't think it's a question of hatred in some sort of you know, sense that this is a nation that everybody despises. It is just an inconvenient reality that some people want to suppress and some people don't want to deal with. That's pretty cold-blooded, but uh, that's the way it is. It is, and this is how we analyze nations' interests at geopolitical futures. And I'll just ask a follow-up question to that, George. How, how do the regional players, so Turkey, Iran, and maybe to a lesser degree, Russia, how do their interests intersect with... Um, the, uh, the SDF and the KRG right now? Well, I think it's this way. Um, none of them will benefit from a Kurdish state, including the Russians. Because if there is a Kurdish state, what we have now is established a principle that we can carve out uh, nations, not just nations, Muslim nations, out of others. And the Russians have a problem with Chechnya and Dagestan and their desire for independence and other Islamic regions. So the last thing the Russians want to see is it is any sort of precedent established for doing this. As for the Iraqis and the Syrians, look, I mean, this is part of their nation to the extent Iraq has a nation any longer. 
It's part of it. Uh, if they start giving up the part they have, what else are they going to give up? So if the Syrians who are fighting to kind of preserve uh, Damascus as the capital of the United Syria, uh, giving up any part of it encourages the rest. So again, this is just a question of nobody having a real interest in uh, Kurdish independence. So this next question comes from Selim, and it's about the Balkans. He asks, go, going into the third decade, so the 2020s, what's the future of the Balkans um, in, the, in this third decade, given the historical role that Russia and Turkey have played in it? Well, you also have to include in that uh, the European Union, and particularly Germany. Uh, this is the historic path for invasion out of the Islamic world into Europe and out of Europe into the Islamic world. Uh, it remains that. It remains a buffer zone for the Russians. Uh, it remains an area where the Europeans are deeply involved in terms of uh, Slovenia and Croatia. So this is the place where huge civilizations meet. And as a result, this is the place where conflict normally occurs. It occurred in the 1990s internally. Uh, we've been in a fairly peaceful situation for the past 20 years. But as Turkey rises and in influence, as Russia becomes more uh, aggressive because of fear of dismemberment, as the European Union has more problems, all of those will somehow be reflected in, uh, in the Balkans. Now, George, in your book, and this is a follow-up for me, in, in your book, Flashpoints, you identified the Balkans as a potential flashpoint at geopolitical futures. We write sometimes about how in borderlands, conflict can erupt that spreads to, uh, to different areas, and, and the Balkans is one of those. How, how, do, how do you look at borderlands? How do you look at flashpoints and how conflict there can become, uh, can spread outside of the immediate region? Well, you know, there are different sorts of borderlands. This is a mountainous borderland. And mountainous means that old civilizations have been preserved in valleys. Most people come to the Balkans to pass through it. They don't really want to pacify it. They can't really pacify it. The last ones who tried to pacify uh, the Balkans were the Germans. And they got a very bloody nose during World War II, simply because all those mountains, all those steep hills, all those valleys uh, are very difficult to conquer and they're places where resistance could be formed. So what you have is a broad geopolitical area, an area in which large tectonic plates can meet. But you also have a lesser geopolitics of the region itself that really can't be subdued. And so you can never quite clear it out, you can never quite pacify it, and it's a culture that never quite gives up. So everybody enters the Balkans at their own risk. We should all remember that the First World War sort of began with Serbia demanding uh, its right to national existence. Uh, one could make the case that Germany lost the war in the Balkans because by having to go there, they had to delay their attack on Russia, on uh, the Soviet Union, and di disperse forces, constantly maintain forces there. So I don't know if that last is true, but I will say that this is normally a dangerous place for anyone to get involved in casually. Our next question comes from Andrew, and he is asking about the Intermarium. And we, we talk about the Intermarium a lot at Geopolitical Futures, which is essentially a new containment line that we, can, um, that we see forming right now in relation to Russia. And Andrew writes, uh, General Pilsudski included Finland as part of the original Intermarium plan, George, do you see Finland joining the Three Seas Initiative? Well, ultimately, sure, they may. But from my point of view, there is a commonality in countries like Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania. They all experienced the Nazis. They all experienced um, the Soviet occupation. This spreads through to uh, the Baltics, Finland is different. It, it has more in common historically with other regions. And therefore, whenever you form an alliance, as the EU has not yet learned, but it's, it's the case, you need to have a commonality, a commonality of interest and a commonality of culture and history and so on. Finland 
did not have that history. So I would argue that they have an interest in being part of it, but a formal alliance, if that ever does come, really needs to be among nations that belong together. It can't be uh, Norway and Greece in one, one, one entity. So this next question I like because it steps back and and asks a broader question. Um, it's from someone with the handle Decessor. I'm imagining that's not the real name. But he writes in, uh, George, what theories of history best inform your views? Well, maybe it is his name or just his mother was cruel. <laughs> but what theories of history uh, – let me see. Well, I draw my most – my greatest inspiration from Hegel. Hegel was a German philosopher, uh, and he, he really wrote something called, well, he didn't write it, he, there were lectures called The Philosophy of History. And The Philosophy of History describe the manner in which history unfolds itself, in retrospect can be understood, and even in prospect can be understood. Uh, he doesn't really get down in that work into the details of how it unfolds, except to be talking about reason. But it gives you a framework for understanding eras and how they happen and understanding the necessity of history and the limits of human intervention. I also read Thucydides, who didn't have a theory of history, but did have a very profound, granular understanding of the way in which politics and war unfolds. So if I were to pick the two that I would pay the most attention to, it would be Hegel and it would be Thucydides, but both of them have to be read very slowly. It takes time. Thucydides was the uh, ancient historian who wrote the, um, on the Peloponnesian War, and he was also a general in that war. So he was really intimately familiar with the goings-on back in ancient Greece. George, I want to ask you a follow-up on this. Um, having laid out how you think about history and, and philosophies of history that inform your view, how does the process, the methodology of geopolitics this framework that you've put together and that we employ here at Geopolitical Futures fit into this broader philosophical view and how, how does it attempt to explain where we are now and where we're going? Well, it fits in in this sense. Um, we understand the idea of necessity in things that human beings do. And we understand that the whole point of the Enlightenment was to overcome necessity, you know, to free human beings to do as they will. So there is this fundamental struggle in individual life and in human history in that. And what I see geopolitics doing, geopolitics not as uh, it was originally conceived of by people like McKinder or Speakman or those, it gives you a framework from which to understand not just the geographical impact, but the impact of a whole bunch of different variables on history. Uh, it allows you to kind of make sense of it. So on the one hand, you have realist uh, theorists of international relations who basically say um, everybody should be realistic and make it something, an argument. Geopolitics says everybody is realistic. They may appear to be fools, but they didn't get to be leaders by being idiots. Uh, you simply don't understand what they're doing. And so that's a very simplistic way to put it, but it's the way I put it, where realistic foreign policy thinkers argue for that as a policy, and idealists argue for that as a policy. What we're interested in is how do nations uh, behave with each other? Uh, Hans Morgenthau, who was a thinker, a great theoretician of this uh, back in the mid-century, you know, called it politics among nations. So how do nations relate? And what I'd like to bring to the philosophical discussion is a fairly simple-minded philosophy, which is that we need to spend less time arguing over what we should do and try and understand what we do do. It's interesting, and it definitely makes for interesting work at Geopolitical Futures as well. For all of our listeners out there, uh, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with George today in an informal way. He tried, or we tried to spell out a little bit of the framework that we use at GPF. If you want to read more, go to geopoliticalfutures.com. And the analysis that the entire team does there is based on the framework that George just laid out. By the way, thank you everybody for listening.
And I want to point out that Xander has to say this sort of stuff because he works here. <laughs> it still makes for fascinating both conversation and analysis. So, George, thanks for, thanks for taking the time to chat today. A pleasure. For more geopolitical insights from George and the team at Geopolitical Futures, sign up for our free weekly email newsletter using the link in the description.